Hello, everyone. It's uh, it's good to be back. It's been a long time. I think I spoke at the one in Denver, or not in Denver, in Boulder a few years ago. Uh, but that and the very first one are the, the only ones. Can you hear okay? Am I close enough to the microphone? Yes. My wife's down here giving me hand signals. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about incretins and the evolution of the GI tract. Uh, like Aaron said, a lot of people don't know about incretins. How many people are aware of incretins and what they do? Okay, a few hands go, but most people don't. So it's going to be a, a pretty interesting thing because they're powerful little hormones that, uh, that do a lot, and we're going to learn how we can modulate them ourselves and, and have good results from that. So let's get going. First, uh, disclosures, I don't really need to do that because I'm not giving a CME talk, but I don't really have any disclosures. Uh, I don't get any money from anyone, unfortunately, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, if you want to copy down this, this is my website, proteinpower.com backslash AHS21. I've got the bibliography for this talk on there, so you don't have to furiously scribble down if you see a paper that you want to remember, uh, because you can just go to that site and it's all there. And I actually missed out on a couple that I'm going to have to go back in and add later because I forgot all about them, but most of them are there. The um, uh, only paper that I've ever written, scientific paper, I wrote with my wife and Lauren Cordain, whom a lot of you probably know, back in the early 2000s. And it was about uh, hyperinsulinemia, the disease of civilization. And in that paper, we talked about incretins, uh, GIP and uh, GLP-1. And I was kind of interested in them at the time, but for whatever reason, I got off on some other track and, and didn't really get back to them. And a few years ago, I had a friend uh, from Hungary named Gabor Erdosi. Uh, some of you may follow him on Twitter. And he uh, gave a talk on incretins in uh, Europe somewhere, I think in Hungary. I mean, he's Hungarian, but uh, the talk was in Europe. I think it was in Hungary. But anyway, it was a, it was a great talk, and it sort of reinvigorated my interest in in Cretans, and so I am uh, kind of ripped off part of his talk and added some of my own, and I went ahead and put his talk up on the, the page on my website so you can see that too because it comes at it from a little different perspective. But anyway, what are in Cretans? In Cretans, the, the one, the main one we're going to talk about is GIP, glucose-dependent uh, insulinotropic peptide, which is a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it GIP from now on. And it has, a, it has a, a, a host of functions that we're going to get into in a little bit more detail later. The other one is GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. It's one that more people are familiar with because a lot of drug companies have gotten into this because they found out that they can make drugs that affect this, this incretin hormone and treat diabetes with it. And so uh, since it takes drugs to do that. We can deal with GIP ourselves. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about GIP. But you can see that um, what the, the glucagon-like peptide does, it does a bunch of stuff, including increasing insulin sensitivity and increasing, uh, increasing the output of insulin, which is why uh, it works better to lower blood sugar in diabetics. So if we look at the, the GI tract, this graphic of the GI tract, uh, GIP is produced in cells called K cells that are in the, in the proximal end, the upper end of the GI tract. So when food, basically carbohydrate foods and lipids go through there, it stimulates GIP and we'll see what it does in a second. In the distal GI tract, that's where the GLP-1 lives. These all are made in these cells called either K or L cells, depending on what it is. Some people think it's the same cell. It just produces a different hormone depending on where it is in the GI tract. But these, uh, these little cells, when uh, glucose or carbohydrate or lipid go by them and they get in the brush border, it stimulates the release of these things into the bloodstream, which travel to the pancreas and do their thing. And you may think that these are, are really nothing deals, and this is a minor issue, but I can assure you that it's not. And people have suspected that there was something to this as far back as 1880. And then another group kind of worked on it in the 19, early 1900s, around 1902, and they didn't get anywhere. And it wasn't really until 1964, the University of Colorado in Denver, when people really got a handle on the power 
of incretinence. And what they did was they, they took uh, patients and they gave them oral glucose, just a, a standard oral glucose tolerance test, like probably most of you have had some time or another, and you see the glucose curve going up and coming down. And then they took these same subjects and they gave them IV insulin, I mean IV, sorry, IV glucose to mimic the glucose curve that they got from an oral glucose tolerance test. And then here's where it gets interesting. They measured insulin levels. And what they, they found out when they did that is when they measured insulin levels based on the IV glucose levels, which were the same, remember, it, it stimulated the same curve as oral glucose, but the insulin uh, response was really muted. And then when they gave them, uh, when they looked at it the other way, with the glucose, so this is glucose that you're seeing now, the insulin response to IV glucose. When they looked at it with the oral glucose tolerance test, it was like that. So that is a huge difference, and that's called the incretin effect. It's, it's a mega difference. And so the, the food going through the upper GI tract stimulates this huge insulin response. And if you believe, like I do, that your health is kind of a function of your overall lifetime area under the insulin curve and it pays to keep insulin down as much as you can, these become really important. And so we're gonna look how, uh, learn how we can modulate them a bit. Uh, and as you see, I just put up the glucose tolerance there. They're the same, uh, the, the glucose levels, both IV and oral, but a mega difference in insulin response. Now this is a guy named Theodosius Dobzhansky who wrote a paper back in 1973 called Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And the whole paper's about that, but he sums it all up in the title of the paper, which is that. And I always try to think of things from that perspective. When I see things that are a little bit unusual in a study, I think, you know, what does that mean? What's the evolutionary basis for that? And of course, the evolutionary basis for insulin is that it's a storage hormone and it allows us to not have to eat constantly. We can eat a little bit and insulin stores the food away. But where do incretins come into the whole picture? Well, if, if you look at incretins, they're along the GI tract, and back in evolutionary times, I mean, back when we were not recognizable, probably even as mammals, you can see those little yellow spots, and those were the cells that basically became the pancreas, and they were in the lumen of the GI tract. Now, the GI tract is really outside your body. So you think of it as inside your body, but it's not. There's a hole in one end and a hole in the other end, and food travels through. And, and if you eat a penny, it's gonna come out the other end, maybe a little the worse for wear, but it's gonna come out. And the GI tract works on food. So these things were located in the wall of the GI tract. And when, uh, uh, but it created a little bit of a hazard because since it is outside the body, they were subject to toxins that may come through, and if you wipe out these cells, you're in trouble. So over, over evolutionary time, these things migrated away from the lining of the GI tract and became the pancreas that was isolated from the GI tract, but the cells can still send signals to the pancreas to let it know that its food's coming in so the pancreas can respond uh, properly. And, that's, and this axis, it's called the enteroinsular axis that sends these hormones to the, the pancreas. The, uh, and this is a little bit better diagram. You can see the lumen and the green cells are the insulin producing cells and they evolved into this where they had bile ducts and little cells around that and they ultimately evolved so that they formed uh, the pancreas. Now when you, when you look at, at what uh, GIP does, it, it has effects on the brain and increases insulin secretion, biosynthesis, increases beta cell proliferation, keeps beta cells from dying. It didn't say in this slide that I ripped off, but it also increases glucagon, which is one reason people don't like to use it or haven't looked at it closely for uh, modulating diabetes. Uh, it increases lipogenesis, which is not necessarily good if you're trying to lose fat, but importantly, it works on bone formation. It increases bone formation and decreases bone resorption. And this is important in hospitalized patients. You all know what TPN is, total parenteral nutrition. When patients can't eat, they, they, uh, they can't even be fed with a feeding tube, so they have to be fed IV. 
and they're fed this nasty stuff called intralipid that has lousy fats in it and there's some protein and there's some vitamins, but it keeps them going. But these patients have bone loss because there's no food going through the upper GI tracts and they get no GIP. So even if you exercise them and do all the things that you can to, to increase their bone health, they get bone loss because they don't have GIP. So that's an important separate function of GIP than just uh, modulating insulin. But it helps insulin kind of get set up for storage. And here's some people who stored fat pretty well. And fat is, is basically a battery for us. And the last statistics I saw were from 2012, but somebody sat down and watched how long people ate. And people eat 1.1 hour, at least they did in 1912, 1.1 hours per day. And that doesn't mean that you only have a meal for 1.1. That's the time you actually spend feeding your face when they did that. You know, you might go to dinner and it's two hours, but you really just spend 1.1 hour based on, on this data feeding your face. And in 1.1 hour, you can go all day long. You couldn't charge your Tesla for 1.1 hour and have it run all day. So it's really a, a pretty efficient mechanism. In fact, it's so efficient that if you, uh, if you take a 70 kilogram male who isn't all that big, it's about 160 pounds, and he's got enough stored fat to walk from Miami to New York. Now, it might be a little the worse for wear when he got there, but he could still make it based on the fat storage. And the guys you saw in that last picture could probably work, walk to Peru and back, but it's, it's a really effective means of fat storage. Now, let's get into, oh wait, sorry about that. Uh, Jeez, I apologize. Too quick on the trigger. Okay, now this is an interesting study. So now we're going to get into to what these incretins really do. And this is a study that they used the same subjects as their own controls. And they started out and they had these subjects eat a pound of apples. And it took them 15, 16 minutes to choke down a pound of apples. <laughs> and then they gave them some time, some washout time, and then they gave them apple puree, AKA applesauce, that the apples were you know, made into applesauce. And then they gave them the apple juice equivalent. And then they did it slow and fast. So in the fast one, they just woofed down this applesauce or drank the juice as quick as they could. And in the slow one, they made them stretch it out over the length of time that it actually took them to eat the apples. And so you can see that in all this, that the glucose doesn't change much. And if you look at that, the glycemic index of apple juice is 41, the glycemic index of an apple is 38. There's not that much difference. Now, if you've read any of my stuff, you know I'm not a big fan of the glycemic index. This makes me even less of a fan. But the glycemic index shows that these should have about the same blood sugar levels, and they do. But when you look at insulin levels, you see a huge difference. And ignore that thing over on the side because the way this paper is written is kind of screwed up. But the, um, the um, so this is a, a fairly narrow range. This is insulin equivalent. You can see the major differences in insulin. And that big peak on the top is the apple juice. And the peaks in the middle are the apple puree. And the peaks down on the bottom are the um, apples themselves. And so what you can... That's the juice and that's the apple. So what you can see for that, from that is when the structure of the food is broken down, even though it's the same amount of carb, the same amount of sugar, essentially, the incretin response is much different. So this is one of the things that makes me a little iffy about, and we're going to see a few more of these looking at different things, makes me a little iffy about people crowing about how great they are on a, on a continuous glucose monitor, which I myself have worn for a few months, but because you can see what the glucose is, and right here, you don't know what the insulin level is. So you can be eating something that, that doesn't really affect your glucose much, but can have a real whopping wad of insulin. So this is, uh, this is done with apples. Now this next one is particle size versus glucose and insulin response. And they did this with uh, fine flour and coarse flour and whole grains and cracked grains. And you can see the same thing. There's not much difference in glucose response, but there's a, uh, a pretty huge difference in insulin response just based on the integrity of the grain, whether it's ground 
or whether it's cracked or whether it's a whole grain, same amount of carbohydrate, same glycemic index, just a big difference in the uh, grain. And you can see down here, the area under the glucose curve uh, almost doubles when you have the wheat refined. God, I hate to be old. Uh, if, here's another interesting one. This is a wheat bread, a whole kernel rye, and then the thinking was that it's the fiber in there that kind of blunts the incretin response. So we're going to take some of this whole kernel rye and we're going to substitute beta-glucan for it, and beta-glucan is a soluble fiber. And then you've got this whole meal pasta, and we'll see what happens there. Well, what ends up happening is that the insulin level runs the highest, of course, with the wheat bread, which is ground, but the number two is the beta-glucan bread. So it didn't make any difference at all. If anything, it made it worse. So it's not really a function of fiber that causes this incretin response or this incretin blunting with uh, the whole foods. And you can see over there that, uh, what is that? That's the, that, oh, that's the incretin response itself. You can see the GIP went way up with that. Um, and that's the GP1, okay. Now we can look at this one, and this, God, it's the same one. What's going on? Did I hit the wrong button? Oh, what they say about it is the data suggests that the structural and compositional properties of fiber play more of a role in the regulation of the insulin response than does the amount of fiber consumed because the rye bed and beta glucon contain more fiber than did the whole wheat bread. So basically that's a roundabout way of saying that the uh, the fiber didn't do it, but it's the structure of the grains. The present study showed that the lowered insulin response was not dependent on the type of cereal consumed because pasta made from wheat and bread made from rye lowered insulin responses as well. It's a functional, uh, a function of the structural integrity of the food. Now here's a great paper. This is a Gerald Rabin syndrome X guy. He got into this back in the 1980s and wrote a bunch of, paper, a handful of papers on it. And I really like this one because he used white beans and um, DC means damaged cells, UC means undamaged cells. And so what he did on the left, these are undamaged um, kind of starch granules within the bean. And on the right-hand slide, uh, the, or the right-hand graphic, those have been crunched up mechanically so that the starch granules, which you can see over there, have escaped. So it's the same exact bean, same glycemic index, same everything and you get essentially the same plasma glucose response, but you get a markedly different insulin response. So just from damaging, just from processing the food. And this is a, this is a, a, a study that shows the decrease in um, fiber content <coughs> over time. And if, if you look at that, the black dots are carbohydrate intake over time from all the way back around 1900. I'm not real crazy about this slide because we got a lot of food wastage now that we didn't have then. But nonetheless, uh, you can see that fiber has, has dropped off dramatically. And not that fiber itself is, is a, a good thing that stops anything, but the fiber is basically a proxy or a surrogate for um, food processing. So when you get the lowered fiber ratio to total carbohydrate ratio, you know that you're eating more processed foods. And it's interesting looking at this over time because the green line up there that just went up, that's during World War II. So you can see that they were starting to eat processed food. I mean, World War I, starting to eat processed foods before World War I. Then when the war came and you had rationing and all that, then they started eating unprocessed foods. Then when the war was over and you're back into the roaring 20s, here came the processed foods. Then World War II came on and bam, you're back to unprocessed foods. And then from that point on, it's just been a slow slide to more and more and more processed foods. Now let's take a look at what happens. What's the, the incretin response to lipids? Now there's a response to, uh, an incretin response to proteins, but it's not very much. Uh, even if you hydrolyze the proteins, you know, kind of like pre-digest them, there's not a big incretin response to proteins, but there are to lipids. And it's interesting because this study is done, what you see on the left is basically the same thing that they did uh, with glucose. They had people drink intralipid, 
which I can't think of anything worse. But anyway, they drank intralivic and they got an IV. And they did it just like they did before. They, they drank it, they measured their tri blood triglyceride levels. Then they gave them an IV amount that would mimic that. And then they looked at what happened. And you can see that there's not a, a big response uh, in glucose, which you wouldn't think. And there's not even really a big response in free fatty acids. And what, uh, what you see, though, is that when you look at GIP, it really runs it up. So when you take lipids, it runs up your GIP. Those are the dark uh, dots. And the lower ones are the IV lipids. So it, it really runs it up. And if you look at GLP-1, it runs it up too. And if you look over here, you notice that the, uh, the, the, the insulin is elevated a little bit. So fat does elevate insulin levels. Why does fat elevate insulin levels? You always hear that it doesn't, but it does elevate insulin levels because it, your body's trying to store it and it's got to have insulin to store it. And it also elevates glucagon. You say, well, why would it elevate glucagon? Well, it elevates glucagon, GIP does, because if you run insulin up, when you're not taking in any carbohydrates, you're gonna become hypoglycemic. So you have this little spurt of glucagon that helps you maintain your blood sugar level. So it does both of those with lipids. Now this is a, a really interesting and kind of weird study. They took, I think nine, how many is it? No, six obese males and they put them on a diet. And I mean a real diet. They fasted them for three weeks and under supervision and they lost 10.8 kilograms, which is what, 23, 24 pounds in three weeks. And what you, what you see on this is that the, uh, the, the God, is, is that it, what they did, you can see the lines above, they gave them IV glucose and then they gave them oral fat. And you can see that the oral fat had the highest response really of glucose and of insulin and almost of everything. So glucose in the presence, I mean fat, oral fat in the presence of glucose really runs your insulin levels up and even can run your blood sugar up. And if you look on the right, this is after they had lost weight, you can see how when they lost their 25 pounds or so in six weeks, that they had a, a sort of a moderation of that effect. Now what aggravates me about this study is I wish they had gotten six normal people and done it too so that we could see what a normal is and what a obese one is and then what the one is where they've lost the weight. But you can definitely see that, uh, that losing weight, losing fat modulates all these responses. And these people drank corn oil, which God bless them. Uh, this, is a, this is an incretin response to mixed meals. I'm not crazy about this study because it's a, um, um, the, what do you call that thing? God, I just went blank on it. The, uh, a, clamp a clamp, yeah, a glucose clamp study, which is non-physiologic, so I'm not really crazy about those. But what they did is they had people eat sandwiches and uh, made with butter and dried meat. Uh, and so they clamped it so that their glucose stayed the same. And then they looked at what happened to the insulin response. And when they ate the mixed meal with the sandwich, the, the insulin, I mean, the insulin levels really went up. But when they ate just the butter, they still went up because in the presence of glucose, which you get with a clamp, fat, oral fat makes your blood sugar go up, makes your insulin go up, and they had, when they gave them the meat, it went up a little bit. But like I say, dried protein is, is a, I mean, dried meat is a lot of protein, and protein doesn't have a big uh, effect on in credence. So that's interesting from that perspective. And you can see on this uh, what happened with the, uh, God, I can't even read this. Uh, oh, that's a GLP-1, and, that, and that's a GIP. But you can see what the GIP really went up in the air with the mixed meal under this clamp study. And when you look at the area under the curve, you can see that the area under the curve with the mixed meal is about three times what it was with just the dried meat. And, of course, that's the incretin effect right there. Now, this next study is one of my favorite studies of all times. And I liked it so much, I actually took the time to do it to make it legible so you're not reading these black lines in a, in a journal. Usually I have neither the time nor the will to do this, but I love this study so much that I did. 
And what this is a mouse study, and it's C57BL mice, which are kind of metabolically broken anyway, but it doesn't matter in terms of this study. And they fed these mice a chow diet, and then they fed them a high fat diet, and this is weight gain along the bottom, and, uh, or I'm sorry, body weight on the top and time of feeding along the bottom. So you can see they gained much more weight with a high fat diet, and they gave them a Western diet, and it was kind of intermediate. Now most people would have just stopped there and said, well, that proves that a chow diet is best, a, uh, um, you know, a, uh, a, a high carb, low fat diet is best, at least, at least for mice. So that's, uh, that's good, but it, this reminds me, how many people have heard Richard Feynman's lecture uh, about cargo cult science? God, if you haven't, you ought to, because he has a story about a guy trying to learn about rat running in a maze and all the different things he does to figure out how the rats find the right door. And he just keeps going and going and going until he finally realizes it's the sound of the floor and he puts sand on it, and then the rats are confused and can't do it. But it's just, it goes to extraordinary lengths in that to, to come up with the answer, whereas most people would have stopped early on. In this, most people stop here, but these guys took it one step further, and what they did was they ground up the food. They completely grounded up all these different foods into a powder, and then when they looked, here was the chow diet, here was the high-fat diet, and here was the Western diet. So a huge, huge difference is made in the structural integrity of the food. And I got to go fast. I've been getting the sign here. This is, this is pretty interesting too. This is a Japanese study. They had, you know, uh, vegetables, uh, carb, and meat. And they should have done this in six different studies, but they chose these three. They had the potential to do six, and they gave them at different times in different orders. And what they discovered is that if you if you look at the response, the uh, the lowest uh, insulin response, or I guess is that glucose? I can't read it from over here. I think there's another one. That's the insulin response. But the lowest insulin and glucose responses came when they gave the carbs last, the vegetable first, and the, and the meat in the middle. And uh, another study looking at ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, and they did this with a sandwich broken down to its components. Uh, the blue is if they ate the carbs first, and you see it goes down, and then it goes back above baseline, so those people are hungry. The full sandwich or the... Uh, uh, eating the carbs last kept, kept the line low. And so the, the, you know, the take home message from this is life is short. Do not eat dessert first. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, we know that, uh, that glucose fluctuations influence what happens to foods that go down uh, secondary to GIP. Here's a doctor friend of mine that sent me this. He had a patient that came in that had blood sugars all over the place, was diabetic. Uh, you can see the date on this thing is back in January 2018. Put him on a, a mainly meat, very low carb diet. And the very next week, you can see the glucose excursions went way, way down. So if you <coughs> keep your glucose down and your excursions down, you're not going to experience, just like these overweight guys did that fasted for three weeks, you're not going to experience the incretin effect as much. Uh, and I've got to mention this study just because Kevin Hall did it and it got a whole bunch of attention. And he put people on an ultra-processed and unprocessed diet, and you can see that the they gained weight on the ultra-processed and lost weight on the unprocessed. And these were the same people using their themselves as controls. And the thing that makes me question this is if you look at the top and you see the glucose response, it's about the same, which you'd probably expect that. But understanding what you do about incretins now, you look at the bottom, and that doesn't really make sense. You've got this little bit of insulin response, but not nearly like we've seen in all these other studies. And so the... Um, uh, the uh, and then I read a press release of the study, and it says an ultra-processed breakfast might consist of a bagel with cream cheese and turkey bacon. That's the ultra-processed. Well, the unprocessed was oatmeal with bananas, walnut, and skim milk. <laughs> if you were given an unlimited amount, which would you eat the most of? And I'm not so certain that the, uh, that the bagel with cream cheese and turkey bacon isn't less processed than the other one. But anyway, 
that's just, just an interesting study, and I'm going to skip over this because we don't need to talk about it, and I'm getting the sign of it running out of time. I want to go through the take-home lessons of this whole thing. And the first one is that if you want to lose weight and you want to improve your health, it's pretty obvious what you need to do. Don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> Which this brings to mind a conversation my wife related to me that she overheard in the women's locker room of a country club we used to belong to. When these, she heard these two overweight women talking, one less overweight than the other one. The overweight woman says to the lesser overweight woman, wow, you look great. How did you lose all that weight? And the woman says, I quit drinking wine. And the other one says, well, that's just too extreme. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you find not eating too extreme, then don't eat carbs. If you find not eating carbs too extreme, don't eat processed carbs. If you find eating processed carbs, not eating processed carbs too extreme, don't eat them first. And don't graze. Give your, your liver and your incretins and your pancreas a chance to rest. Eat fewer larger meals instead of the old thing about eating all these little meals all through the day. And eat mainly meat. And there you go. Thank you very much. And I'm on time. So we have about eight minutes for questions, so please come and use the mics on either side of the room. To, to address the mic in the center of the room. <laughs> oh. uh, uh, Michael, thank you. Great talk. Um, you mentioned Gabor Adosi early on, and uh, I'm sure most of us follow his work along with Ivor Cummins and others that are available quickly on the internet. Um, and I'm wondering if you're familiar with, because I mean, the world of wearables are continuing to develop and as you mentioned, the CGM technology is ever more available. Um, it's not quite there for a wearable insulin assay or a wearable uh, insulin test, but um, Gabor is working on a project along with uh, Eric Smith, and I'm wondering if you're familiar with this project. Metabolic is what it's called, and it's a, a point of care, uh, a point of, yeah, point of care real-time insulin assay. Uh, along with an app that they're developing that, no, it sounds great, that provides the blood data and, and plots curves, so glucose and, and insulin, so you can see those yeah. rather than off to the lab and three days right, later. Right, right, right. So it's pretty. an exciting, yeah, and I'm going to mention this talk to Gabor. Uh, yeah, you know, I read uh, just a few days ago that uh, in a, a paper, a peer-reviewed paper, that people were working on a ketone monitor that was like a continuous glucose monitor, uh, but I don't think it's made it beyond into the commercial phase yet. Uh, yeah. But it's interesting, it'd be nice to have that too, but it would really be nice to have an insulin monitor. Right, and um, I think the first step that they're working on is really trying to get it to clinicians to work with patients, um, and again, to, to plot their blood, blood data in real time. So. That's great, thanks. I've seen you know the debates as to whether high insulin leads to insulin resistance, or it's the other way around, or it's some combination. And I'm wondering if this uh, incretin uh, factor plays into that. Do any of these studies look at this effect in insulin resistant versus insul insulin sensitive people? And also does eating more structured food reduce your, your chance of getting insulin resistance? Well, based on, I mean, I just showed you the tip of the iceberg in these studies. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of studies that show all this same stuff, and not just these that I picked out. And they seem to, it would imply that it would, but I don't know. I've not seen a study that was in cretins and insulin resistance looked at at the same time. But they know it runs it up, and, and since uh, the higher your insulin is, the more or the less sensitive your receptors become, you would think it would. Just logically. Amber. My question's a bit related. So you were talking about the effect of fat on insulin in the presence of glucose. Presumably it's less when there's lower glucose. It, do you know if there's a difference in the ketogenic or fasting condition compared to the other non? I had not seen that. I, not, I mean, not that it doesn't exist. I've just not seen a paper looking at that. <coughs> it would be interesting to see. I'd love to know. Yeah, so would I. 
<laughs> I don't know what effect, if any, ketones would have on, I mean, circulating ketones would have on uh, in cretins. Or just the glucose sparing effect. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I don't know. I've not seen that. Thank you. <coughs> all right. I think that's uh, all the questions. And so let's thank Dr. Mike Eads once again. <laughs> now we know what incretins are. <laughs> and how important they are. And so with that knowledge, we can all go and make an appropriate choice for lunch during our lunch break. And uh, we'll be back here for the afternoon sessions that kick off at 11, I mean at 1.40 p.m.